and uh, I appreciate the men that were able to attend the work day yesterday. Of course, these last several Saturdays, men have been faithful to come and help and get uh, <clears throat> things ready for our floor and other things. I wasn't myself wasn't able to come yesterday. I was busy all day with customers, but anyway, I appreciate these brethren that have come and helped and getting things done that needs to be done around here. Uh, the upstairs projector, we matter of fact, we have ordered two of them now. We've been, we've had two, we've had them canceled twice because of being out of stock. But the ones that I bought this past week, they were supposed to have been here yesterday, and they were delayed in delivery, but they have been shipped. They are, uh, FedEx has sent me a notice that they are on the way, and they'll be here Tuesdays, according to FedEx. So hopefully by next Sunday we'll have new overhead projectors that you'll be able to enjoy a whole lot more than than the ones that are wore out up there now. Anyway, um, so uh, I'll give you a little bit of a report on Brother Bud. Uh, he's still he's still a very sick man. Um, he still got pneumonia, double pneumonia, and. Uh, He's really, he's really, his numbers are doing good enough that they, they have absolute confidence that he's going to live over this, but, but it's going to take him some time to get over it. And they've had to give him such high flow of oxygen that he is, uh, his, his body's became dependent on oxygen. And so they're trying to wean him off of it. But it's, it's, it's hard, you know, they start cutting down on oxygen, his body starts fighting for air. And so they're trying to find that balance of how much they can cut down at a time without it uh, affecting him so much. But they want his body to go back to work and begin to produce its own oxygen. So that's where he's at right now. But they said that their hopes is that they'll get him improved enough that he can possibly go home next week with oxygen. They don't think he can go home without oxygen. But anyway, so, and since he's alone, he, he needs someone there to take care of him. Wish Brother Memo Cano and his wife, they'll do that. They'll stay there in his home with him and take care of him. Uh, so anyway, it's it's encouraging that he's getting better. It's a little bit uh, sad that it it's you know going as slow as it is, and that but but it certainly beats the alternative, <laughs> you know. So I think he's dodged a, a bullet this time. I asked him. I said, "You ever been this close to death?" And he said, "Well, if you want to count." bullets being shot at you. I guess I have, but that didn't last very long. He said, this here's lasted. <laughs> he said, that, that's over when the bullet's gone by and you're back in your, you know, you're back in your foxhole and the shooting stops. Well, that kind of leaves you. Of course, there's a fear for the next time it's going to happen, but he said, but this here sticks with you the whole time. <laughs> so he said, I've never been through nothing like this before. <laughs> so I, I did for the first time well, it's about the second time. Talked to him yesterday on the phone, and he was very difficult to understand because he's having a hard time talking for, with air. But anyway, they do have him off of an oxygen mask onto a cannula now. So that's you know they're making they're making progress, and his oxygen level stand up in the mid 90s. So he's doing good. His oxygen level's been around 93 to 96 on a cannula, so that's good. Anyway, so uh, we just want to keep praying for him. Brother Daniels has got a giant 
card for Brother Bud over there, and there's a pen on that on that table where I sit that uh, we'd like for y'all, everyone that can, sign it. If somebody wants to get it and pass it around the tables, uh, you can do that if y'all would sign it. Maybe put a little something on it. Brother Daniels is going to send it to him. He's always... He's always had that uh, burden to always send, you know, cards to, to people, especially get well cards when they're sick all over the body. And I appreciate Brother Daniels having that uh, care and, and taking that over for us, helping our church get uh, represented, helping our church get its love to, to these people. Uh, does anybody have any Bible questions? I mean, yes, ma'am. When, when will, when will we have a temple, temple worship? We haven't had it yet, have we? No, not in the sense that I think you're meaning. Um, <clears throat> you, you could say we're having t out, outer court w worship of the tabernacle of the temple, but <clears throat> I know what she's talking about. She's heard most of her life <clears throat> about the body, you know, uh, getting, number one, the in the... Uh, 11th chapter of the book of Revelations, we'll just start there, just to show that, uh, by the way, I do have a new uh, introduction in the form of an index to the book of Revelation, which shows a synopsis of what every chapter is about. If anyone would like that, I'd be glad to text it to you. Or, you know, if you'd like to have that, uh, I'm probably going to have that. In, I'm I'm writing the book, and I'm have I will have that each chapter's index or summary introduction to each chapter in the book. But this is just the complete index, chapter one through chapter 22. Some of the brethren I've already gave it to, but. If someone would like it, well, just let me know, and I'll I'll send it to you. If you send me a text, then I can just reply to the text with that attachment, you know, or send it to your text. And I wonder, can you get the whole thing to a text? Seemed like I had trouble. I don't think it took the whole text. I had to go back and 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 add add more to it. So. If you have an email, it'd be better if I sent it to your email because you'll get the whole thing. Unless I send it to Messenger. Messenger will take the whole thing. So anyway, just uh, it basically tells you what's in the beginning of every chapter. There is two different notes in it that explains the seals and the trumpets. It helps give an explanation on that. And when it, when we, it enters the seals, I explain them. When it enters the trumpets, I explain it. It's, it's, I'll just tell you this much about it. The eighth chapter, the seventh seal opens. And the seventh seal is opened until the end of the book. The seventh seal is basically the entire book. The first six seals are really indexes the seventh seal there that's just a uh, introduction you might say uh, just giving a little synopsis in those first six seals the biggest seal is before the eighth seal is the sixth seal which is covered in half of the sixth chapter and all of the seventh chapter and that's because it's all in, in the last prophetical hour and that's why but just like in the trumpets, I'll give you this on the trumpets. The first six trumpets is in eight, chapter eight, nine, and ten. The 
seventh trumpet starts in the eleventh chapter and goes to the end of the book, and that finishes the seventh seal. It's all part of the seventh seal. So, and the and the seventh trumpet is all the last prophetical hour of the Gentile world, and that's how important it is. Look, the first six trumpets is chapter eight, nine, and ten. The seventh trumpet, which is the last prophetical hour of the last 15 years, is the 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 21, and 22. Eleven chapters that the Lord spends on. I made them kids mad and they got up and walked out. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're starting their Sunday school class today. Anyway, that's how important the last 15 years is, is that half of the book is on the last 15 years. So it's, it's pretty emphatic, you know. But anyway, the, that, that summary will tell you that. And then when I get finished writing the book, well, um, the, that summary will be at the be, that introduction will be at every book. Anyway, um, here in the 11th chapter, it starts off... <clears throat> There was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and leisure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city they shall tread underfoot forty and two months. So he starts off right here. In fact, I told you the seventh trumpet starts in the eleventh chapter. It does, but it doesn't start until the fifteenth verse. It tells you in that fifteenth verse the seventh trumpet sounded. So that's when it starts. But right here, it's starting off with with showing that the church fell away, and even the outer court, the temple had to be measured because it needs to. Somebody needs to know the measurements of how to rebuild it because it's done away with. So <clears throat> that's what the book is about, and the New Testament is, of course, helps us to understand what has to be restored in the church. But so here, there's nothing left but the outer courts, and it's been trod underfoot. And if you read the book of Ezra and ne Nehemiah, you'll see that even part of, the, part of the outer court had to be restructured, part of the foundation, the furniture, had to be replaced. Uh, so, <clears throat> but then if you look forward in the in the eleventh chapter of the book of Revelations, um, after the seventh trumpet, see the fifteenth verse said, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world become his kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he'll reign forever and ever. But then if you go down to the 18th verse, it says, The nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voicings and thunderings, and the earthquake, an earthquake and great hail. So here, this shows the temple of God is opened. I talked on this one time and in a meeting, and one of the ministers asked me the question, said, well, when was it ever closed? They said, the temple never was closed. I said, oh, yeah, it was. I said, it wouldn't need to be open if it wasn't closed. If you go back to the first verse, you see that the temple was done away with. That there wasn't nothing left but the outer court. So the temple, as far as the holy place and the, and the holy of holies, was done away with. That existed in the early church. And so, to answer Sister Crow's question, we won't have... Uh, temple worship as far as the holy place is concerned, which is a sevenfold light. That's where the candlestick is in the holy place and the, the uh, uh, table of showbread with 12 loaves of unleavened bread on it, which represents the doctrine of the 12 apostles 
It's unleavened. It's not, it doesn't have any deceit in it. It's not puffed up with yeast. It's just unleavened. It's the truth. I remember Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He was just showing, you know, he said in another place, he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a, unto a woman that took three measures of meal and hid, hid uh, how does that go? Hid, uh, hid three measures of meal and the whole, uh, the whole was leavened. Well, uh, I teach those three leavens of those three measures of meal was uh, that leavened was leaven that went into the teachings of Moses, the law, the prophets, and the teachings of Jesus Christ. Those three things were leavened by the Pharisees and the Judaizers, and that whole thing got leavened because of that. So he was telling them, you know, to beware of their deceit and their falsehood. And so <clears throat> um, until the church is restored, there's no way we can have temple worship. Uh, it's going to take a restored church for us to get back to that place. If, you know, this body... I really do believe there there were our some of our forefathers had depth in teaching the word of God to the point that this body never taught that you could overcome sin any time down through the dark ages. It was that was never taught in this body in generations before this generation. Now William Souders is the one that it, the question came before him at the campground. And the question was, Brother Souders, do, can we overcome now? And his answer was, is I think we have enough truth to overcome. That was his question. That began to be taught, and that's what was taught me when I first came to the body, that we can overcome now. We have enough truth to overcome now. But, of course, you all know I've changed on that. And um, uh, it, it's going to take temple worship. It's going to take getting in a divine order of God, and it's going to take a sevenfold light. <clears throat> if you can overcome anywhere, anytime, down through the dark ages, you don't need this body, and you don't need this teaching. If you could overcome in the Catholic Church or the Methodist Church or any other church down through the dark ages, or even if you didn't go to church, just by reading the Bible then you don't, need, you don't need a restored church and you don't need this body. Uh, but the, th the fact is, is, is it takes, you know, I gave y'all, was it last week that I talked on the harvest, showing that it takes a harvest, and the harvest doesn't come to the last prophetical hour. And it's going to take God harvesting the world. That's how he does it. You can't change God's methods and His ways. Uh, you know, I, Brother Leninger, you know, when he, when he began to talk about in the early church, they had, <clears throat> they had uh, 45 years. The day of the Lord was a day and an hour, 30 years, and, and uh, I mean a month and an hour. So it's the day of the Lord, 30 years and 15 is 45 years. And uh, if you take, if A.D. 33, if that would be the date we was working with, since we don't have any absolute proof, but that's pretty well looked at that way, anywhere from A.D. Uh, AD 30 or A.D. 29 to A.D. 33, uh, and add 45 years to it, it, that takes you to A.D. 45. I stick with that date because it fits. It takes you to A.D. 75. So if you take half the, the last half of their prophetical hour, it'd take you to A.D. 37 and a half, and they'd have seven and a half years of wrath or judgment before after A.D. 70. You'd have five years after A.D. 70, excuse me. So, uh, but the wrath started before A.D. 70. But anyway, I used to tell Brother Leninger, I used to say, Brother Leninger, how, why did they get to have 45 years to overcome and we only have 15 years? You're saying we only got 15 years. 
He said, well, Brother Smith, we can't change the word of God. I said, I, you know, I don't know why God did it that way, but that's how it is. And I said, well, you've got to have a better answer than that for me. <laughs> yeah, can you all hear him talking like that? Yeah. Well, Brother Smith. Yeah. One time I was, we was in a motel room in, in Haiti, and I was giving him a revelation I, that I felt like God gave me. And he listened to me. And uh, he said, Brother Smith, God give you a revelation on that. But he said, this last part you're talking about, I'm sorry, Brother Smith, but that ain't, that, that ain't right. I said, how do you know it ain't right? He said, well, I don't, I don't have the teaching on it, but I heard a man talk on it one time, and the Holy Ghost quickened me, and I knew it was right. And that's how come I know you're wrong. I didn't like what he said. In fact, it made me mad, but I didn't let him know that. But after I got home, got studying it and praying to God about it, I seen he was right, I was wrong. God gave me the rest of the revelation. I went back and gave it to him. He said, you got it right now. <laughs> but, you know, he, he, he was something else. <clears throat> I gave him something. I, I gave Brother Leninger the 14th chapter of the book of John, showed him that mansions was not a new body that it was, the, it was the Holy Ghost. I showed that to him. He said, Brother Smith, God, God give that to you. He said, that's right. He got studying it. So one day we was at the campground, me and him both was fixing to walk in the back door on the platform. He said, Brother Smith, you going to talk in this meeting? And I said, I don't know. I've been thinking about it. He said, what are you going to talk on? I said, well, I've been thinking about talking on mansions. He said, let me talk on that. They'll, ex they'll accept it for me better than will you. I said, go ahead, Brother Lanning. <laughs> but he didn't talk on it. But then I thought, you're going to take my message away from me and you're going to preach it <laughs> like it's yours. But he never did do that. Every time I ever gave him anything, he'd say, Brother Smith gave me this. He'd tell the brother that. He'd say, Brother Smith gave me this. He said, and, and God gave him something that's right, and I want us all to know it. He'd give me credit for it if he thought about it. <laughs> anyway, so um, temple worship. Now let's 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 look in. Let's look at the holy place just a minute. Uh, the holy place is. This is where I told you the table of showbread was, and the uh, candlestick. The seven. The seven golden candle, the candlestick that had seven bowls that was lit with oil in it, and it was seven lights. That represented a seven sevenfold light, which means the, the, the full and complete truth. Uh, and then there was the altar of incense in the, in the holy place, <clears throat> and uh, that's where in, in, there had to be uh, myrrh and had to be offered up in the holy place. The priest had to take the coals off of the altar, take them into the holy place, and pour incense over them, and it would create a, 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 a smoke and an aroma, and it had to be an absolute mixture exactly how God wanted it mixed. One time, Aaron's son's decided to mix it the way they wanted to mix it and they got they got slain for it god will not permit anything in the holy place to go wrong that ought to be one thought concerning a fallen angel that a fallen an that an angel could corrupt all of heaven when just somebody could mix the wrong mixture of myrrh in the holy place and immediately the wrath of god had hit them it doesn't make real good sense to think that an angel could start a rebellion in heaven and God would honor that rebellion, and or not honor it, but allow it to take place and allow it to go on to a point that, you know, some people teach that the third part of heaven, third part of the angels was drawn out of heaven with that, which that ain't even what that scripture's talking about. But... <clears throat> That scripture's in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation where a third part of the angels uh, 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 
were drawn out of heaven, that's talking about, y'all have heard me on the thirds, that's talking about those that missed God and rebelled against that divine order of God back there in the early church, uh, a third of all those that were rebellion, it's not just a third of them, it's, it's just a third of judgment took place there that judged everyone in the three times of God's judgment, the early church, the end of the Gentile world and the restored church and then down through the thousand years. Those are the thirds. There's three thirds or three times of eternal judgment in the world and a third of the angels, that all, and that's all of those that rebelled back there, or re, you know, that turned and fell away. In fact, I think sometimes, uh, I think we ought to look at, <clears throat> uh, for the saints' sake, Look at whether or not you can fall from grace. Because, you know, part of the world teaches you can't. Uh, that's one of the main Baptist doctrines of sovereignty. That you, you, you're God sovereign. If you're saved, once saved, always saved. You ever heard that? That's, that, that's their teaching. They teach you, you can't fall from grace. But I can show you several scriptures that you can fall from grace. But sometimes it do you good because you may, before this is over with, there's going to be a lot of people come in here and they're going, to, they're going to sit at your desk and want you to tell them what's going on and what's right and what ain't right. And you're going to need answers for them. But anyway, here the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And that's the holy of holies. That's just showing that uh, that once second heaven opens, that opens third heaven. That makes that third heaven available. So this 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 table of showbread of the unleavened twelve loaves of unleavened bread. Um, that's what we're laboring for. We're laboring for having the unleavened truth of the Word of God that there's no falsehood in it whatsoever. And then the, the sevenfold light. Look in the second chapter of, of the book of Revelations. Um, and let's look at the... And it's, this, is, this, this is the letter to the church at Ephesus. But it, he's dealing here um, in the fifth verse. Here's what he tells them. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. That's why I, this is one of the reasons that I believe that the book of Revelation was written before A.D. 70 and not in A.D. 95, like the Catholic Church uh, uh, says that it was, because there was no candlestick in A.D. 95. The church had fell away. It had fell away. John saw it falling away. And he was shown in the eleventh chapter there where the temple was closed. There wasn't no, there wasn't any holy place in A.D. 95. But in A.D. 70 there was a golden candlestick in those seven churches. But what God was showing them is, if you don't correct the things I'm showing that needs corrected in your life, that I'm going to remove your candlestick. I'm going to take the sevenfold light away from you. I'm going to close the door on this age. And I'm giving you time to correct the things that I'm showing you that needs corrected in this in your lives in this church. And by the way, there was just seven churches written. Obviously, there were way more than seven churches in Asia. That the only uh, answer that I have for why uh, you know why why there were only seven churches. Number one, seven is the number of completeness. Uh, every one of these churches got all seven letters. They got the whole book. They got the whole book that John wrote. So they got the whole revelation. And so I think the Lord was saying, okay, I'm going to pick 
seven of the predominant churches, and I'm going to show you all seven things that's wrong with a whole lot of you. A whole group of you has got some of these problems I'm identifying, and I'm telling you, you need to correct them. And so, <clears throat> to me, that's reasonable to, to see that's why God wrote it that way. He wrote it to the seven prominent churches. It is possible that those were leading churches that had oversight of uh, other churches, you know, like mama churches. Uh, but, but I would say it may be more reasonable just to see that it's a number of seven uh, of the prominent churches uh, in Asia that everyone was connected to, knew about, and they all got these letters. But not, not, this letter is part of the book. And so the rest of the book, the fourth chapter through the 22nd chapter went. Those people, I'm sure, didn't have near as much trouble as we have understanding the book of Revelation because they understood all these symbols, you know. And I'm sure it was in their language and it was pertinent to their time. And, but they got to look into the future and see they were Gentiles. A big part of them were. And so the Gentiles were able to look into the future and see what the apostles had said, that there is going to be a restored church for the Gentiles, and Jesus is coming in the end of the Gentile world because I'm sure that a few Gentiles were able to make the bride that in, the, in the early church. People like Cornelius and his household that were proselytes that were connected to... Uh, they were connected to the church back there uh, and, and, and with such a connection that they, they were able to glean enough to overcome. So I'm sure there's some, a few, but for the most part, Gentiles coming in, they didn't, they probably, they didn't have time. Besides all of that, the whole Jewish world, I mean the whole Gentile world was outside looking in. Hadn't even, many of them hadn't even heard about the body of Christ yet. I mean, look, you're, you're a Gentile. When did you find out about it? So we're, you know, we, there's no way we had an opportunity to get into that harvest back there. But even many of them that lived back there probably didn't, weren't able to, uh, they probably weren't able to uh, in, engulf or envelop the whole message enough that they were able to to receive the whole sevenfold light. It's, it takes time to get this message. It's 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 time consuming to to be uh, directed and in, and developed by God into righteousness. So here the the seven the candlestick. Um, uh, was they were th it was threatened that their candlestick would be removed if they didn't uh, if they didn't go back and and repent and do their first works over. So <clears throat> they they had a candlestick is my point and 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 so the the divine order of God was still intact in those seven churches and there was a promise to them that they could still overcome and make the bride and so. But then later, uh, later in the 11th, if you go back with me to the 11th chapter, does anybody have any questions of what I've said so far? If I'm, I, sometimes I wonder if I'm making things plain enough that, you know, if I'm just rattling and you're just let, listening to the rattle. Or if you're actually, you know, if, it, if you're actually able to decipher what I'm saying. Um, back in the 11th chapter, <clears throat> he, he uh, let's go back in, I, I mentioned there in the uh, second, chap, second verse of chapter 11, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city. Shall they tread underfoot forty and two months? That's 1260 years. 
he, he not only was showing that, hey, the things fell away, it's been tread underfoot, but, uh, but it, I mean, it's, it's, it's fell away and went into darkness, but the treading it underfoot, he's talking about the 1260 years of Catholicism that reigned, which didn't happen until, didn't start to 538, so there was 500 and, uh, what, almost 500 years of darkness before even the outer court, even before the outer court began to be de uh, developed with the Catholic Church, but they trotted underfoot. They weren't able to even actually understand how the outer court was to operate, nor was the, the furniture intact properly. Uh, but anyway, then he goes down and he, I'll just give you a synopsis here. He t goes down, shows the two olive trees, which is the Old and New Testament, that, um, uh, that still, there was still judgment by the word of God, even though it lay dead. If you, if you, you go to the seventh verse, it said, when they shall have finished their testimony, talking about the Old and New Testament, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. That's Catholicism, that uh, the Word of God didn't have any, there, there wasn't any anointing that could, could bring life to the, to the Word of God. The Old Testament are the new. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. The reason it's called Sodom is because Anytime you take the Word of God and you take it in the flesh, that's, that's committing spiritual sodomy with the Word of God against, against the Lord. And then Egypt, it's, it's two things. It's spiritual and civil uh, perverseness. Uh, the Egypt represents uh, one of the dragon powers. And so it, it, it represents civil power. And Sodom, it does represent spiritual, but you've got to have a little bit more understanding of the symbolic, how it's used symbolically here, because it's using with, it's, it's a man trying to become intimate with the Word of God without God's help, without the Spirit of God at all. It's all man with man. So, and the, then verse 8 said, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street. Oh, I already read that. Verse 9. And they... Of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. That three and a half days is the same as 1260 years. Um, a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. It, it's, it, and um, it was a thousand, um, 1260 years, three, Three and a half days is like three and a half years, which is 36 months, which is 1260 days, Jewish days, 360 years to a calendar, Jewish calendar. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. In other words, the, the, these, the word of God, it tormented because it, Anytime you'd read it, it'd bring, it would bring judgment. It would, you know, even though it was in sackcloth and ashes, it still would bring judgment, and it still, you still could not escape the judgment of the Word of God. It was still there, whether you not you'd recognize it and recon acknowledge it or not. But then verse 11 says, after three and a half days, which is the 1260 years of Catholicism, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Okay, so after the 1260 years, and that's when Martin Luther started out with the Reformation, with uh, the revelation that the just shall live by faith, and that, and, and of course he got thrust out of Catholicism and turned against um, uh the the Catholic Church turned against him. In fact, he had a, war a death warrant out on him to kill him. And uh, but that's where the spirit of life came back. Now, now from there, now to verse twelve. This is amazing. One verse 
there's there's um, how long? Three sixty four five. There's over five hundred years takes place in these two verses. Skips. The spirit of life came into them when the Reformation began. Then verse 12 said, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That's a restored church. So there was 500 years that took place from the time that, that the spirit of life came into them until the voice from heaven said, Come up hither. And they ascended unto God in a cloud. And their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake. That hour is the 15 years of prophetical hour after the church is restored. And that earthquake is America falling. That's going to shake this world. And the tenth part of the city fell and the earthquake were slain of men 7,000 and the remnant were frightened, gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe is past and behold the third woe cometh quickly. First woe was Roman Catholicism and Mohammedism in war with each other. That gave, that, that took uh, attention from the Catholic Church it, away, away from the Reformers so that God could start the Reformation. Then uh, the second woe was America falling. Third woe was the Battle of Armageddon. So it'll, that will come quickly. So then the next verse starts, the seventh angel sounds, the seventh trumpet sounds right there. And then God gives us all kinds of information into the last prophetical hour. I was thinking about that this this week. I'm, I'm looking at and trying to consider the 15 years, this prophetical hour, and I'm in conjunction with that, I'm trying to relate to God's, what God's doing here with coronavirus. This, we have had, not only in the world, but in the United States, we've had several pandemics down through the last, you know, few couple hundred years. There's been several pandemics. The, the, somebody give me some of them that remembers. The Spanish flu of 1917, 1918. Yeah, Spanish flu. 1917, 18, SARS. But if you go way back before that, Black Death the, in Europe, the, Ages. the Black Plague, they're, they're, one, they, they're one they just called the plague, if I've got it, if I remember right. Uh, polio was a, was a big problem way back. Uh, there's several different pandemics that's hit. So I was asking God this week, I said, God is... This just another pandemic uh, that's come on the world, or does this have longer reaching effect than that? See, here's one of the things we got to consider: is we're right down in the end of the Gentile world, and um, the body of Christ has been in existence for over a hundred years now. And we're looking out of it for a restored church. And this pandemic hasn't only affected the world, it's affected the body of Christ in a great way. We have not had a meeting. This brotherhood has not had a meeting in a year. That's never happened in a hundred years. We've never had anything stop us. And a person would have to be a fool to think that God wasn't aware of what this pandemic would do to the body. So in my opinion, and I'm trying to be careful about, you know, the Lord is very, very uh, concerned about men, his prophets that say, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord didn't say nothing. So I'm trying to be very careful about that. I'm not saying what God said when I didn't hear what he said. But I am asking him about it because we're living in a time that, I think I think the world never will be the same. I don't. I think the body will never be the same when this is over. I think this there's a change coming. God's fixing to make a change worldwide in Christianity as well as uh, civil powers, as well as you know the the world is considered. 
And so uh, we may be right on the verge uh, of a restored church. Like I said, if, if my time frame is right on it, A.D. 33 is when the church would be destroy, dis, uh, restored, but I'm, I'm flexible on those dates. That's just the best I can come up with. I mean, I've got, I can preach it so that you believe it absolutely 100% that it's right. If, you, if you're listening to me and your mind's open, it sounds right. I wouldn't be preaching if I didn't think it's right. <laughs> but on the other hand, I have to be, be realistic enough to realize there could be something I'm missing that God may need to adjust. However you want to look at it, you've got to know that we're, we're not too far away from the end of the Gentile world. And there are several things that's got to happen. One of the things I've been preaching uh, online is this. What's got to happen before the end of the Gentile world? Number one, the church has got to be restored. Number two, the two-horned beast in Revelation 13 has got to make the image of the beast. Number three, Babylon has got to be judged. Number four, the ten kings are going to have to gain power and have be over the kingdom before this thing's over with. Then you're going to have to have seven vials of the seven last plagues that's going to judge this world, starting with the church. The very first vial is poured out on the earth, which is America. And then it ends in the Battle of Armageddon, which ends this world. So uh, there's got to be a restored ministry. That ministry is going to, there's going to have to be a harvest. The bride's got to be made up. All those things have got to take place. And if A.D. 33 is right, we've got just a little over 12 years to get all that done. Or... Uh, before the church is, re well, till the church is restored, we've got about 12 years, and then we've got about, I'm going to say, around seven and a half years to, to accomplish all of that. But probably the last seven and a half years is going to be the pouring out of the vials and the wrath of God being poured out, ending in our Armageddon. So, so I'm looking at this pandemic as being different than other pandemics, but I'm, at the same time, I'm still asking God I believe what Amos said. I think God doeth nothing, but first he shows it to his prophets. And I believe God will give us the answer in plenty of time for the saints of God to know what he is doing. But I think we ought to be considering that, you know, this thing could be more sobering than what you know. I will tell you one of the things I think you can look for. I think more devastation is going to take place if it is. Because God is going to drive his people to the altar before this is over with. God is going to humble his people to the point that they see they need God. And people are going to start flocking in the church. That's already happening in the Dominican Republic. People are over there. They're dying over there. They don't have the help, the medical help, on the same level that we have. And the people are starting to flock in the churches over there and start falling on their knees and seeking God because they got family members dying and people are catching coronavirus because they don't have the perfect protection and people are out of work, people are starving to death, people are hungry. they got a need for God, a greater need than we got. That's happening in Haiti too and, and different places. So, you know, uh, one of the things... <laughs> It's just so hard for a missionary to try to learn to work with. It's, it's like, I, let me give you an example for hate, of Haiti. I would say there's, there's, probably, there's probably, I know there's hundreds and maybe thousands of people in the body that, over there that don't have a vision. Let me tell you something. When you're in a poor country, people are starving to death, and you've got a body of people that's blessed by God, and you can help them in any way. A little bit of rice, a little bit of beans, a little bit of love. People, people will come to that and flock to it, whether they get a vision of it or not. They're looking for natural help. And when God blesses you naturally, you will help people. And if you've got any compassion, you'll help people. And so, boy, it's hard sometimes to discern, you know, is this person, are they just in this for what they can get out of it naturally? Or are they getting this? And when you're dealing with multitudes of people, 
it's difficult to hone down to really locate the individuals. It just has to become a pastor's job. And pastors need under pastors. They need help. Anytime you got more than 40 people, you need more than one man dealing with them. I'm just telling you that. You can't, one man can't deal with more people than that. It just takes, it just takes too much time to deal with people, especially in times of trouble. So, but anyway, there is a, uh, there is, temple worship is coming. And, you know, just remember this. There's not Israel. Look at the multitudes in Israel that missed God when he sent Jesus to that world to harvest it. It's, change is hard. and Sometimes it's hard to think, man, this could be it. I'm going to tell you something. I've been thinking, you know, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm praying and I'm trying to figure out how to hone down my natural life to a point that I can turn my ministry over to God and give him whatever he wants me to do without me being hindered by natural things. I'm concerned about where we're at in the end of this world and what God is doing. And I don't want to be lax or blind or not have my mind open. Brother Green was asking me last night, he said, Brother Smith, he said, what's the difference in being afraid of God and fearing God? I said, there ain't no difference. Afraid and fear is the same thing, but I said, but what you're talking about I said, afraid is a piece of the pie. Fear is the whole pie. I said, the fear of the Lord is, number one, you better be afraid of God. You better be afraid that if you're not serving God properly, that you're going to get, you're going to get the wrath of God on you before it's over with. You ought to be afraid of God that even if you're serving Him, the more you serve Him, the greater awe. Now, this is part of the pie. The awe, the respect, the reverence for God, recognizing His greatness, the, the, the fullness of His glory. We, we, don't even, we can't even fathom God in His wholeness, in His completeness. But, but to fear Him, the whole piece of pie is all of that. It's, it's having a literal fear of God. I'm... Brother Green told me, he said, well, Brother Smith, I don't think I'm afraid of God because I'm at peace with God. I said, I'm at peace with him, but I'm afraid of him. I said, I'm afraid that I, if I'm not sensitive enough, I'm going to miss him. I'm afraid that I may not get his favor. I'm afraid that he's talking to me and I ain't listening. I said, that keeps you humble. That kind of fear keeps you humble before God. But I said, but... I also reverence what I do love and know about him. I do count, I, there's a great awe of reverence in my life of recognizing what I do know about his glory, what I do know about his greatness. I said, that's all part of the pie. I said, just being afraid of God, I said, well, you better be afraid of God. You know, you better not be so, so, sure, so, so sure of yourself that, there's not any fear whatsoever that you, you may not be accomplishing what God's asking of you. I said, I ain't got there yet. You know, I don't, that may be, a, I think that's a place you can get when you get into temple worship, Sister Crow. I think that's a place. Uh huh. That's also another good one for afraid. Unwilling or reluctant to do something for fear of the consequences. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. That's true. You know, so I, I want to be as sensitive as I can be. The Apostle Paul said, be careful for nothing. In other words, the little things. What you might count nothing, take care over it. Be careful. You know, because uh, especially the more you know about him, the more you'll fear him. The more, and, and that's talking about more having respect, more, the greater awe you're going to have for God. See, I'm, the more I learn about God and, and, and the more I understand, you know, what God is, you know, I know that God wants me to be like him. And that's a big, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big, those are, that's not just a step, those are steps, lots of them. 
And so, you know, uh, and then how to operate. How much love, how much brotherly love do I have? How much do I care for others? Do I just care about me? You know, there's so many hang-ups you can have in life. You, you, you know, selfishness. You, you can, if you're not careful, you'll be so eat up with selfishness that you care nothing about nobody else. You can destroy people with your lack of care for others. And, and you know, we got to have, we got to, we got to, it's like somebody was talking to me about being a pastor, saying, man, I don't want to be a, a pastor. Who was it, brother? Somebody in, maybe in Wichita, somebody was talking to me about, you know, I don't think I want to be a pastor. Well, you better want to be one. You may not be called never to pastor a church. What a pastor is, is just leadership. And every one of us are called. Are you going to rule and reign with Christ in the bride? You better learn something about leadership. You better learn something about being, loving other people, caring about them, having the whole care in your life. It's, you know, God's not going to, he's not calling all of us to be a pastor, you know. Who's, who would be mine? Which one? You can't be everybody's pastor. There ain't nobody to pastor if everybody's a pastor. It's just God training leadership. We all have to move into those areas and learn leadership of how to discern righteousness, of how to care and be a Savior. Saviors shall mount up on the Mount Zion. That's every one of us in a restored church. Praise God. All right, I, I didn't have nothing to say today. But anyway, we'll take a break and have church upstairs. That's really the truth. I, I thought when I sat down here, I thought I ain't got a clue what we're going to do today. <laughs> I didn't have my mind, wasn't on nothing. Yes. The church, okay, the church has to be restored. Um, the end of the world has to be harvested and the bride be made up. Okay, then, then, then Babylon will have to be judged. Uh, the two-horned beast will have to be made. Then... Uh, the ten kings will have to come into power. The beast will have to come into full power. And the dragon. And then the seven vials will have to be poured out in judgment, ending in Armageddon. That's before the... the that's, that ends at the end of the Gentile world. All those things got to transpire in a pretty short period of time. Well... Well, all this is going to have, the church is going to have to be restored within 12, a little over 12 years, which would be A.D. 33, if we're right on the date. If that starts 15 years, then but before America goes down, she's got to make the image to the beast. When America goes down, then the ten kings will, will take over. Then the beast will rule, and the dragon America will be a dragon, but it will rule for a very short period of time. Then the ten kings will rule with the dragon for a while, but then they'll destroy the dragon. Babylon's got to be judged during that time by the body. So there's a lot of things got to happen. You get, you get multitudes out of Babylon, how long is that going to take? It'll take a few years for sure. Of course, that will happen down through the 15 years too. I don't think, well, it, it happens in the hour, the 15 years, Babylon being judged. So, still, we're only looking at 27 years. 27 years ain't very long. I hope, I'm hoping I can live that long, but that's probably a big hope. <laughs> but if I don't make it, I'll be back. <laughs>